This video is sponsored by Research Hub. Now, this is a monster of a video, not because it is scary, but because it is a thing of extraordinary or daunting size. And well, a lot and a lot of research and review articles have come out this year, which has certainly kept me busy, and much of which, until I made this video, I completely forgot about. So I thought it would be useful to revisit some of the biggest longevity breakthroughs from this year all into one video as a helpful guide. I've used timestamps to break the video down into useful sections, and I'll make a playlist of all the relevant full-length videos mentioned, as obviously I won't have as much time to cover all the details here. Firstly, we'll look at research that has improved our understanding of the aging process. Then we'll look at advances in cellular reprogramming. We'll then look at senescent cells and senolytics, and lastly cover supplements and diet. So without further ado, here are this year's longevity breakthroughs. So firstly, we got some more insight into understanding the aging process. And speaking of aging pathways, we learnt more about the sirtuins this year, a family of proteins that use the metabolite NAD+, to remove acyl tags from proteins. In particular, I did a deep dive on sirtuin 6. Overexpression of this protein in one particular mouse strain extended lifespan in both males and females, and it reduced frailty. So 2 and 6 is found in the nucleus and activities are mainly linked to DNA repair, but how exactly it promotes longevity is still unclear. There has also been some advances in ageing clocks this year. These are biological markers that can be used to predict one's chronological age, sometimes can be referred to as your biological age, as it is a more accurate prediction of your health status than age alone. One you're most familiar with is the epigenetic clock, which uses DNA methylation. We'll come back to this later, and there has been some advances in predicting age with even less data input, though I haven't read these studies yet. Whoops. <laughs> but a study I did read developed a different clock that is called IH, an inflammatory aging clock that is based off protein abundance in blood of individuals aged between 8 and 96. Unlike epigenetic clocks, I age identified a factor that is part of the clock that may also be functionally associated with aging, the protein CXTL9, which is also involved in cardiac aging. And speaking of cardiac aging, cardiovascular disease is a common age-associated disease, and a reduction in microvascular density and arterial stiffening also occurs with age. This year, there was a publication that explored whether FEGF a protein that gets secreted from cells and promotes the growth of new arteries could help. Well, mice treated with FEGF lived longer and had an extended health span, including features such as reduced muscle loss, reduced abdominal fat accumulation, and reduced bone loss to name a few. The mouse strain don't live as long as other mice strains, so it will be important to see how reproducible this work is, but I'm pretty certain we will hear more about FEGF next year, so don't forget it. So, how much of ageing is genetic? Well, previous work puts estimates on the heritability of ageing from 20 to 30%, mainly from twin studies, to 48% and 33% in men and women respectively, if it's a family with a centenarian. But it's also thought that these may be overestimates, with heritability of longevity being closer to 16% or even below 10%. Heritability is the ratio of the genetic component to the sum of the genetic and environmental factors. Now, there is no right or wrong answer to the heritability of human lifespan, simply because heritability seems to be specific to a population and the environmental exposure current in that population. The interesting question is then to know whether any and what regions of the genome we have on ourselves is associated with longevity. Well, a study came out this year and they've identified some rare genetic coding variants from a cohort of 515 Ashkenazi Jewish centenarians. By having a cohort of similar descendants, it helped to homogenise the genetic background, making it hopefully easier to detect any causal genetic variants linked to longevity. So what did they see? Well, they sort of further confirmed what is seen in other model organisms, such that there is a longevity association in the insulin and AMPK signalling pathways but interestingly, they also found pathways linked to human ageing that have not been identified in model organisms, such as the protective effects of rare variants in wind signalling on human lifespan. Now, a topic that isn't formally a hallmark of ageing, 
that I nonetheless think should be, is the gut microbiome and how it gets perturbed with age. Our gut microbiomes play various roles within the body, from aiding with food digestion to shaping our immune response. This biosis has also been linked with type 2 diabetes and obesity. One way to modulate one's gut microbiome is through the lovely process of faecal microbiota transplants. I'll spare the details, but in this publication from this year, they performed this microbiota transplant from young mice to old mice and saw restoration of many markers of brain health, such as a reduction in microglia size, which suggests that they are less inflamed, and this was correlated with improved spatial memory performance tests. A topic that is a hallmark of ageing that got some extra insight this year was loss of proteostasis, how proteins get misfolded or aggregated with age. Proteins need to be correctly folded to perform their function. Misfolding can also happen due to the incorrect amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, getting inserted. This was elaborated on in this study here, where they found that if you slow down the process of protein synthesis, translation, it improves the fidelity of protein production, and this increased the lifespan of yeast, worms and flies. Translating, pun intended, to humans may be a challenge, but I think this was a cool study. And speaking of cool studies, a study came out this year where they used partial cellular reprogramming in the heart of mice. The heart loses regenerative potential with age and tends to fix damage by patching up with fibrotic scars instead of generating new cells. Here, by controlling the expression of Yamanaka factors in cardiomyocytes, so heart cells, so that it caused partial but not complete reprogramming, it got the cardiomyocytes to replicate and reduce the amount of heart function lost after myocardial infarction. And so cellular reprogramming is the process of going from one cell type to another. Commonly, it is used in the context of describing how a differentiated cell, like a heart cell, can be converted into a stem cell, an undifferentiated cell, that has the potential to keep replicating and also to become many different cell types. As you might imagine, this is really interesting technology, and so it may not surprise you to hear that there are many companies pursuing this further, which down the line could lead to regenerative therapies to treat ageing. Indeed, this year has led to the announcement of many more companies joining the space. This includes Altos Labs, reported to be backed by billionaires Yuri Milner and Jeff Bezos, and includes scientists in the reprogramming space such as Manuel Serrano, Wolf Freak, and Steve Horvath. Then more recently, Brian Armstrong, CEO of Coinbase, announced the company New Limit that he is helping to create with Blake Byers, hoping to extend human health span. I was very fortunate to be able to speak to Brian about this announcement, and they're currently in the recruiting stage, so as of yet, it's unclear who's going to be part of the team. So, exciting times. Now, this brings me on to senescent cells, and to me it feels like loads of research has come out this year regarding senescent cells, but this is also my research speciality, so maybe it's what I read most, and just survivorship bias, but there has been a lot of cool research nonetheless. There's also been some recent research out of our lab, but I'll release a video on that shortly. Senescent cells accumulate with age and are thought to even drive aspects of ageing, which is fitting given the evidence that removing senescent cells has benefits in old mice. Here, using a genetic tool, they remove senescent cells based on the marker P16. But P16 doesn't mark all, nor only, senescent cells. Senescent cells are heterogeneous, there is no one type. So interestingly, a study came out this year where they identified senescent cells expressing a different marker, P21. Here, removing P21 positive cells intermittently improved physical function in 23-month-old mice. And so again, this supports the clearance of senescent cells that accumulate with age being beneficial. Selective removal of senescent cells are called senolytics. However, these experiments I've just shown you are using a genetic approach. But there are also other ways to clear senescent cells with more approaches identified this year. One of the more long-term out-of-the-box thinking involves being able to activate our immune systems to actually clear the senescent cells. This strategy seems promising based on a demonstration that accelerated aging of the immune system, achieved in this mouse study by enhancing DNA damage, 
resulted in the accumulation of senescent cells. Rapamycin was given to this mouse model and it reduced markers of senescence in immune cells. So it suggests at least the involvement of the immune system in detecting and clearing senescent cells. And it suggests finding ways to activate the immune response or prevent immune decline during aging may be ways to support senescent cell clearance using our endogenous system. But this year we've also seen further development beyond the conventional approach. Namely, we looked at an antibody drug conjugate approach and a vaccine-based approach. These target senescent cells by binding to proteins expressed on the surface. The hope is that these approaches could be more specific to senescent cells and may minimise any impact on healthy cells. At the moment, both these approaches are kind of proof of principle, and so I think it's far more likely we will see the adoption of senolytics first to a wider audience. Speaking of which... This year led to the publication of a new senolytic discovered in grapeseed extract, Procyanidin C1, which when given intermittently to old mice, extended their lifespan, as you can see here. It will be interesting to see this followed up in human clinical trials. Now, this latter study technically also falls under the category supplements and diet, which we'll cover now. So diet then. So 2021 has brought many new insights, but things still seem a little bit unclear. And I made a summary video on this that was covering a review article that's basically looked at all of the current mouse data to see how the different diets compare to each other. And to me, one of the clear take-homes is the fact that it's likely to be very dependent on the individual in question. However, a study that I presented at the beginning of the year showed that restriction of dietary branched-chain amino acids, so leucine, isoleucine and phalene, in wild-type mice starting at midlife extended the lifespan of males, but not the females. In terms of supplements, it's worth mentioning the announcement of the rapamycin PEARL trial that is on the way to test rapamycin in 200 participants over 12 months at different doses that will evaluate different blood tests, body compositions, faecal microbiome testing, immune and inflammation health tests, as well as the methylation age clock and skeletal muscle tests. And it also caught up with Dr. Brad Stanfield this year, who's also in the works of conducting a trial using rapamycin. We also got the first data from a small human clinical trial on alpha ketoglutarate supplementation, where based on an epigenetic biological age estimate, they saw an average a decline in biological age of eight years after an average seven months of use. In this video, I made some important points regarding how much we can take from the study, but there are other larger trials in the works looking at more measurements so I'll let you know that data as soon as it comes out. And this trial is being coordinated in part by Professor Brian Kennedy, who very kindly came onto the channel this year for an interview. And on that note, I also want to give a shout out to all my interviewees this year. This was new to me and I really enjoyed doing them and I hope they complement the more in-depth analyses that I like to do. Now, I haven't covered everything in this video in terms of longevity news this year, so let me know what I've missed and what are your longevity highlights for the year. And with that, I'd like to thank the sponsor for this video, Research Hub. Research Hub is a platform where researchers can upload articles, summarize and discuss the findings in reward for research coin. The overall aim is to accelerate the pace of scientific research and to make it more accessible. I've already been using the site and have uploaded the papers relevant to this video. Find a link to Research Hub in the description. So with that, Happy New Year. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.